afternoon, good evening, and um, welcome to tonight's positive living. I have the first question ready because I'm all I have such a skin hair problem to come. Um, it is with Dr. Michael Varnish, who is a nutrition and genetics expert at Revive, and he specializes in facial aesthetics and also preventative health, preventative medicine, which I've been listening about today, and it's fascinating if, if you're into that. He sounds like he's really the man to go see. And so with that, I'll hand over to Dr. Michael and say, hope you enjoy it. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, and thank you, uh, everyone, for attending this evening and uh, spending a little bit of time to understand um, menopause and the skin, actually. So uh, as Elizabeth said, uh, my background is preventative health. Uh, I'm a medical doctor and I've worked in facial aesthetics as well. And so, um, you know, I've, I've, uh, I'm very well placed, hopefully, to talk to you and uh, give you some knowledge about what happens in our skin when we uh, go through menopause and, most importantly, uh, how uh, we can sort of avoid it or certainly improve the skin's health during that time. Um, I've got a little presentation, don't worry, it's very, very short uh, and sweet, but it's something visual on the screen for you all to uh, see. So I'm just going to share my screen, so please bear with me, and I play it. Hopefully we can uh, see the screen now. I'm just going to um, start. So let's start with what is the skin? Because, um, you know, we all know what the skin is, but what is its actual role? And I think once we understand what that role is, we can understand, delve a little bit deeper into um, what, uh, what problems can occur during menopause. And what does the skin actually do? Well, it's our amazing waterproof barrier. It protects us from uh, the external environment very well, and obviously water as well. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a fantastic functioning organ. And that's one of the key things here. It is an organ, just like your liver, your brain, your heart, uh, your kidneys. The skin is an organ. It's extremely complex. And it's actually, uh, well, probably uh, people argue which, skin, uh, which organ is the biggest, but the skin is up there um, with, with the top ones. So, you know, it's our protective barrier. It's got lots and lots of functions, really, really a uh, key organ. So if we think of it as an organ, we can now think, you know, the problems of the skin are just as important as other diseases. So if they become dry, itchy, scaly, um, acne prone, you know, these are all disorders uh, of this organ. Now, the skin has a cycle from new skin cell to dead skin cell. Um, we know the dead skin cells rub off our surface. Um, and that skin cycle typically should be around five, six weeks. Um, sometimes it can be fast and the turnover is quicker and we can get congestion in the skin and that can cause acne. And sometimes it can be slow. And when it's slow, we get drier skin and potentially more flaky skin and we've got bigger, um, bigger areas of the dead skin uh, on, on, uh, surfaces on the top. So we really do have to keep that skin cycle nice and balanced. And when we lose the function of our skin cells, that can go either fast or slow and cause symptoms, okay? The skin's also our window to our internal health. As a doctor, I use skin as a very, very good examination tool. You can guarantee if there are some skin issues going on, there are probably underlying issues. Many, many diseases, things like inflammatory bowel diseases, they all come along with skin um, symptoms and you know it, it really is a window into your internal health and a very good window so if we can keep our skin looking great you know it's quite a reassurance to us inside that we're doing okay as well and um, because inside is just as important okay so um, let's think about what happened uh, what we need estrogen for and some of our other hormones as well so obviously menopause uh, is our reduction in hormones and one of those key hormones is estrogen and particularly with skin it's the estrogen side of things that is a bit more problematic when it starts to fall and it falls quite rapidly when we begin um, uh, before we get to menopause our progesterone starts to decline relatively um, steeply um, but then all of a sudden estrogen all of, uh, does a nice plummet down and we need to understand 
um, why the menopause affects the skin in the way it does, which we'll come to. We just need to understand what estrogen does um, to the skin. So estrogen actually is extremely important. It plays a big role in the skin. Its main roles in the skin are for growth and repair. So remember, we've got that constant skin cycle going all the way through our lives every six weeks from new uh, baby skin cell to the dead ones on the surface. And estrogen plays a massive uh, role in the regulation of that, the repair of skin cells when there's damage. And our skin is exposed to a lot of damage. You know, it's our frontline defense out there. Estrogen is very, very vital for that. It also maintains uh, a couple of skin proteins, mainly collagen and elastin. And so collagen and elastin give our skin the toughness, the rigidity, uh, the, the nice, um, so, um, nice appearance of the skin uh, when we've got lots of collagen in there. So estrogen helps maintain those proteins. It also uh, actually is a, almost a signaler as to where fat is deposited. Um, when we're nice and youthful, fat's deposited in the right places, in our face, keeping it nice and uh, plump. <laughs> um, and also in women, breast tissue as well, uh, sexual organs, etc. Um, unfortunately, when estrogen dips a bit, that fat then, uh, that control of fat uh, deposition changes. Um, you know, fat's allowed to then go mid drift. So we lose it off our face and it's about 2% fat, facial fat loss every year. So quite dramatic. Um, and we lose it from the breasts and we deposit it around our waists uh, instead and bottom usually. Um, so estrogen has a big role in that as well. And actually, um, very importantly, to keep those skin cells functioning normally so they can do those other things, um, it also has a role in transporting nutrients as well. And again, um, our skin needs nutrients like every cell in our body. We all need uh, that nutrition. We, we're not new to that um, idea, but estrogen is one of the carriers there. So when we look at that, what, you know, when we look at what roles estrogen does have in the skin, when menopause happens and estrogen dramatically declines over a very sh relatively short period of time when we compare it to um, the men who seem to be get off a bit lightly here, um, but you know that it, it declines quite rapidly. And so what we're gonna what's gonna happen? We're gonna get disruption of cellular growth. So our skin cycles more often than not go a bit slower. So a little bit more towards the dry, uh, skin side of things. Um, sometimes though, you can get acne where it gets congested and it goes faster. And that can be an interim phase where progesterone can be at play there and there's a natural imbalance between um, the estrogen and the progesterone. And that's why um, hormonal acne can settle down a little bit later on um, because it tends to be that imbalance that causes that. Uh, so more often than not, we get disruption in the growth of that uh, skin cycle, so our skin gets a bit drier. Um, it can't repair as easily, um, which is important as well. So damaged skin cells even more can't grow and uh, function normally and can lead to more problems. We've got um, the maintenance of collagen, elastin and the fat. And you know those things are very important for the way the skin looks, but it also is our structure to the skin and that's why our skin can so dramatically change uh, in appearance, really. And that's why wrinkles can appear, um, you know, a lot of my patients say almost overnight or within the week. And, um, you know, we, we do lose the ability to uh, make that collagen and elastin. And, you know, the fibers do break down as well. Our body's constantly recycling them. So if we're breaking them down more than, um, than we're, you know, we're able to build them, then we're going to see a decline. There are some genetic factors at play there where people break down collagen more naturally, uh, more excessively, should I say, uh, naturally than others. Um, and that, that will, um, you know, that genetic influence is, is important as well. And then obviously another important factor is the nutrient transport aspect. If we can't get nutrients to those cells as adequately, how are we then going to uh, continue that cellular function? And, you know, it's almost like a spiral. Estrogen goes down, so it interrupts function. The function interrupts further functioning of the cell. And eventually we get quite an aged skin cell or a diseased skin cell. 
So that's not what we want. Um, and obviously this is a natural thing that happens. It's not all doom and gloom, don't worry. We'll get to it a bit brighter later on. Um, but you know, we need to understand this to be, be able to figure out um, how to counteract it, okay? So that's just what happens naturally. Unfortunately, we live in a very different world to when humans became uh, a part of this planet in their true foot, in their human form as it is now. So what are we up against? So just to add some more um, bad things into the pot, I suppose, um, what are we up against? So unfortunately, um, you know, we, we, we are faced with a lot of environmental issues as well, just to make things worse. Now, the human body has been in its state um, pretty much genetically uh, non-evolved since for about 200,000 years. It's a long time. So way longer than estimates were initially made, a very, very long time. Now, each generation now, our environment changes significantly because of technological advances and, you know, our bodies aren't keeping up. Apart from being able to digest lactose in some individuals and, and the red hair gene, our genome hasn't really changed too much in 200,000 years. So, um, you know, we've got little tweaks here and there, but pretty much has been, uh, you know, the functioning of the body is pretty uh, straightforward, not changed. What has changed is the world. And what we're now finding is that we're living in a world where we've got decreased nutrition and increased exposure to toxins, okay? And when we put this into context of the menopause, there are some um, that, you know, I once uh, read, read a book actually, um, and in some languages, there isn't a word for menopause. I don't know if you're familiar, but certainly uh, some, some Japanese, uh, very rural islanders, because they don't experience um, significant enough symptoms to give it a name. And so um, I think, you know, the fact that we add this onto that natural occurrence of what happens, I think it can make the symptoms and certainly the skin problems uh, far worse than what would normally have happened 200,000 years ago uh, if, if we were lucky enough to live into midlife back then, we weren't uh, captured by a saber-toothed tiger or anything. So, um, you know, our lives have dramatically changed and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about toxins because it's important to understand. We have our cell and we, every time we make a molecule of energy, we make a toxin, it's called a little free radical, and we have enzymes in that cell that detoxify it. Imagine Pac-Man with, with a little fruit, you know, it gets rid of it and it neutralizes it. That's part of normal metabolism. Every time we make a molecule of energy, you can imagine we make a lot, we make a lot of toxins. So um, we, we have these programs established to neutralize these toxins. Some are better than others genetically. It's one thing I, I, I look at as a doctor. Um, but actually, the toxin exposure is increasing. So the chemical world now, 80,000 chemicals that we use now around the world, I think 4% have been truly tested on humans to find out whether they're safe or not huge exposure to chemicals, whether it's in your carpet, on your new dining room chair that I'm currently sat on, uh, whether it's pesticides in your food, um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons in your fossil fuel burning and car fume burning, cigarette smoke, smoking foods, um, you know, we build these toxins up. And one of the biggest causes actually in the modern world, stress. Stress takes a lot of energy, as you all know. Um, so you imagine how much toxin you're producing when you uh, when you are stressed and therefore you know stress does age you that's why because it takes up a lot of energy and you're probably not putting enough nutrition back to detoxify so we've got our enzymes in our body that take away these toxins but sometimes they um, are overworked sometimes genetically they don't work very well and um, so we need some support from our diet and they come in forms of our antioxidants our vitamins our minerals and we get them we eat them in our diet and we can really um help those enzymes out with the battle against daily life uh, the modern daily life so we've got some problems there um to sort of overcome on top of the natural <laughs> you know occurrence of what happens when estrogen withdraws and one great example here guys is that Pesticides is, an, is a pollutant, okay? They're sprayed on our foods. Unless you eat solely organic, you cannot escape pesticides. Now, we have detox 
detoxification enzymes in our body. Uh, pesticides will help detox, uh, they will help detoxify against pesticides. But pesticides not only making toxins, with estrogen metabolism, they'll send the estrogen to be broken down via a different pathway than a more uh, beneficial one. There's two different pathways it could go down, actually it's three, but it's, I'll keep it simple. There's two different pathways, a good and a bad, um, and they use two different enzymes. Estrogen gets broken down into lots of different other products. They're, number one, the first pathway, is really beneficial products. They help the cells to hunker down, they don't proliferate, uh, they don't encourage cell proliferation like cancers. Um, route two, the byproducts of the estrogen when it's broken down by route two, do proliferate cancers. So, um, you know, they can promote that. So if we're using pesticides, well pesticides not only create toxins and cause problems, they stop route one as well. And so your estrogen, when you do have some estrogen, it'll be going down uh, the route two and breaking down that way. So those of you that are considering HRT and thinking about HRT, um, you know, there are some things there that can, can be done to help minimize uh, the impact of it, um, depending on where you want to go. So there's this toxin nutrition picture. And unfortunately, we live in a world where nutrition is, a, is not getting very uh, good anymore. Convenient, fast food, I like to say food-like substance um, that fills you up, but doesn't give you the nutrition you want and then increase of toxins. And we need to close that gap. We need to reverse it. We need the nutrition to be up there and the toxin exposure to be as low as possible. We can't all go and live on a cave, in a cave on a mountain and avoid toxins. They'll get us somehow now in the modern world, but we can do some things to sort of balance things out. Okay. We're here because it's menopause in the skin. So I've done a bit of a background his, uh, history and science lesson, I think. There, so um, we've just described what happens when estrogen withdraws. So how does that manifest as skin symptoms? So I've got some pictures on here, I've got some hives, I've got some hormonal acne, I've got uh, acne rosacea, very, very common actually. Um, and I've got sort of itchy, dry skin, pretty much eczema um, is the umbrella term for that sort of thing. Sometimes it's just itchy without the, the um, manifestation of the discolorment. So estrogen withdrawals, so we get a reduction in our supportive tissues, um, so the collagen and elastin are going. We get a reduction in blood flow because the body responds to that. And um, because the uh, estrogen isn't um, maintaining that blood flow as, as nice, we get therefore a reduction in growth stimulation and worsening repairing, and we're getting deregulation of the immune cells that live in our skin. Remember our skin's a barrier. So it's got lots of specialist units there ready to attack. So they're getting confused with a lot of, uh, a lot of the things that are going on, especially when we've got chemical exposures as well. Um, and that leads to um, hyperactivity of the immune system and it can attack its own cells or flare up when you're exposed to things that you've been exposed to in the past. Uh, so that could be something natural or it could be that a chemical in your washing powder so all of a sudden your immune system doesn't like it because the environment that, that's uh, in your skin has changed quite dramatically because of the estrogen loss, okay. Um, so we've got lots of different things that can happen. Um, when we uh, have that heightened sensitivity, um, it can also damage the tissue even further. So there's lots of things here going on that could go wrong and it's no surprise then, I hope to you know, why it's so common to have skin issues during the menopause. Um, we also, um, lots of people complain of drying skin. So I've mentioned that the slower skin cycle can cause drier skin. There's another thing as well, and that's because there's a little, little uh, cushions of water called hyaluronic acid. It draws water in uh, and they give your skin nice moisture. And those are little pockets of moisture within the skin. And the skin, um, when we, basically lose our skin function because of all those things we've said, the skin doesn't produce as much hyaluronic acid. When it doesn't, we are more prone to drier skin. And we all know what dry skin means. You, I'm sure someone knows someone that has eczema, which is a dry skin condition. It means itchiness. And that doesn't have to be eczema, but it can be widespread. And, it, and that itchiness then also can promote 
more um, aggressive immune responses, more redness, more problems, and actually more itching. Itching is a really natural way um, of healing as well. Um, it's an immune, it's linked to sort of immune uh, barrier function, uh, itching your skin, and I know it can cause problems in the long run, um, but they think it's due, uh, we, we itch because of a protection point of view. So if your immune system again is, um, is heightened, then uh, itching can be uh, certainly a problem. Um, so I'm sure we've got some more questions on itching later on anyway from Elizabeth. So um, I know it sounds bad, but I absolutely believe as a doctor, and I've seen it time and time again, when um, I prescribe bioidentical hormones, when I do genetic testing, when I see male, men and women um, coming in with problems like this due to um, natural phenomenon or or not natural ones, if we change that balance between nutrition and toxin and put nutrition up there and toxin down there and figure out how we can uh, protect our body uh, and do that, then actually the outcomes are brilliant. And, you know, we can limit the symptoms, may not ever be able to go completely, it depends obviously on genetic factors and your lifestyle, but certainly you could limit them. And in lots of cases, you can reverse them as well and have an easy ride through a very diff potentially difficult time. So what do I suggest? Well, um, I think I like to put this into three separate areas. There's an internal approach, an external approach, and I'll give a competition prize winner for someone that comes up with a better name than in between approach. Um, but I quite liked it, I thought it was fun. So um, we'll start with my internal approach and that's thinking, remember your skin is the window to your internal health. So if we improve that, we will improve the skin. Most diseases do have skin manifestation symptoms. Um, menopause isn't a disease. Um, but there is a process there that is significant uh, biochemical changes and metabolic changes, probably even more significant than a lot of disease pro pro um, processes. And so, you know, let's not call it a disease, but we can still apply that, that same, um, this same sort of approach. So how do we do that? Well, we need to improve our diet. So Here's my little ha life hacks for anyone that's interested. So remember, we need more, um, more antioxidants in our diet. We need to try and get five different plants or more a day into you. And that is without fruit. Fruit is full of sugar, and sugar causes toxin production. So let's keep sugar low, even in fruit. Fruit's your treat. Fruit now replaces chocolate and avoid fruit juices as well. But five different plants, a day will get you a very, very good start to um, a good level of nutrition, okay? So that's step one. Um, sleeping, sleep is so um, underrated. <laughs> it is absolutely essential for us to detoxify against all these things because we're gonna get nice nutrition in now, we're gonna do some avoidance of chemicals. To do that, we absolutely need to sleep seven to nine hours a night now. I know I'm talking here at a menopause event and I know sleep is an issue. Um, and so <laughs> I, I've got some tips here as well. Um, obviously those that don't want to go down um, a HRT route um, and for sleep particularly, I do champion bioidentical personally and um, because the progesterone is the real relaxant uh, there. And obviously in, if you give in a good amount of progesterone, um, you want it bioidentical, it's more beneficial than having something more synthetic and um, acts in a similar way, but isn't the actual um, hormone. Um, so if you, don't, if you don't want to do this without HRT or you want to do it on top of taking HRT, et cetera, then um, actually think about devices. So it's getting dark now, it's getting dark earlier. We're all staring at screens. Um, I'm just as guilty as you guys, but we should probably have blue filter glasses on because if we do that, we're able to make our melatonin. Devices, phones, laptops, computers and TV uh, and bright, bright lights, we need to dim them down or filter out the blue light during the night. And that will help us fall asleep nicely. Reading for 10 minutes is a great thing to do. Um, but really try and reduce it a couple of hours before bed or put your glasses on when they go dark. Uh, you can get prescription blue light filter glasses now, 
what a great modern world we live in. So, um, you know, get those on. You'll be able to secrete more melatonin and you'll, you'll get to sleep easier and quicker. Actually, the, the hours before midnight are so beneficial because of the way our other hormones like cortisol wake us up. If you can get a couple of hours in before bed, that's amazing. And if you want to go one step further, don't eat anything, just drink water or potentially just a, a herbal tea uh, without caffeine in, uh, no more than four hours before bed. So give it four hours. That allows amazing detoxification. Our body's not distracted with any digestion. It can go forward and do that. We need to move more. Um, if we're withdrawing hormones, we want to protect the hormones we do have. Um, and our muscles are amazing at uh, being metabolic powerhouses, stimulating hormone production. Um, and so moving more is absolutely essential. And I know it's harder in the winter in the UK specifically um, to do that. So anyone that's got stairs, there's a stair challenge. Get, get doing 10 flights of stairs a day, 10,000 steps a day, you know, get moving. Actually up and down hill or staircases is brilliant and down is just as good as up. So get moving. It doesn't have to be a personal trainer or a gym. You can do it really at home, nice and easy, um, obviously. If you want to go for personal training in the gym, that's fine. But remember, every time you make a molecule of energy, you make a toxin. So don't overdo it. Give yourself a good chance to uh, rest as well. It's a balance, isn't it? It's not very easy, this. Um, okay, so uh, avoiding toxins. If we can go organic, brilliant. The other thing I would promote is when we eat animal products, that they are grass-fed, pasture-reared, um, free-range because of the way industrial farm works and because, um, because of uh, you know, to feed big populations, having those um, animal products in that way gives you the nutrition that you're looking for. Otherwise, it's kind of dead nutrition. You know, B12, really essential for sleep and energy levels can be depleted uh, in menopause really easily. B12 is made in a cow's stomach. What do we feed cows to fatten them up? Antibiotics. And guess what? Bacteria is the thing that makes the B12. So that steak, you think you're having a good dose of B12 with, maybe not, unless it's a lot, you know, not fed antibiotics. Fish, omega-3, let's dampen down the immune system with some good omega-3s. Uh, let's have a salmon then, but unfortunately farm salmon, which is the most common now on our supermarket shelves, um, is fed corn. It's not, fed, it's not feeding on plankton and therefore your omega-3 levels yeah, not very good at all. So you're eating that corn, you're basically eating um, corn on corn. <laughs> it's, it's not very uh, nu as nutritional as you think it is. Um, sorry, I sidetracked that. But, you know, pesticides, think about where your food comes from, what's being tampered with. It becomes a hobby when you're obsessive like I am. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, it's uh, keep an eye on that. Now, the other toxins and things to look out for are... Um, you know, we can't, we can't avoid most of it. Um, but cleaning products are a good source of toxins. Um, cigarette smoking, if you smoke, um, and, you know, pollution as well. So you might need to just put the ante on the dietary intake of antioxidants, if that's the case, um, or supplement. Now, the last part of the internal approach is look after your gut buddies, your gut bacteria. So actually, um, Another little sidetrack, but interesting fact, uh, a wheat plant, you know, a grain of wheat uh, has more uh, genes than we do as humans. So you think, well, how does that work? Well, we actually outsource most of our jobs to our gut bacteria. Between us, we have 10 times more genes uh, than without them. So we outsource a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the processing we need to do to our good bugs uh, in our bacteria. We are symbiotic with them. We need them. So, you know, that's why people can get so unwell after huge courses of antibiotics because it clears out the good guys as well as the bad. Um, but we want to look after those good books. So what do they, what do they like? Fiber. They absolutely love fiber. Um, actually, pre and probiotics. So there's not much evidence in terms of uh, probiotics, but prebiotics is your stuff like fiber, and your, your nutrients and foods, they love it and absolutely love it. Things like garlic, onions, I think, at the top there. Um, garlic, onions, what else have we got? Kale, spinach, and broccoli. 
um, and they love cauliflower as well. You know, really fibrous, nutritional food. They will love love those. And actually, interestingly, sync sync signals all the way around your your body. They are sending chemical signals when they take on these nutrients, positive ones that we interact to. And that's why um, it's becoming a very very interesting area of preventative medicine at the moment, uh, and something to keep your eyes on. But let's keep it simple at this stage for skin. Um, lots of fiber. So once we've looked after our internal self, we're going to be glowing outside, hopefully at this stage anyway, and also all those other symptoms that come with menopause hopefully can be helped as well. And um, we could um, supplement as well internally. I've put some on there as well. Um, we've got selenium. Selenium activates one of our skin's uh, uh, antioxidant enzymes. Remember the Pac-Man eating the toxin? Well, selenium needs to turn on Pac-Man. Um, so we need plenty of selenium. Brazil nuts are an amazing source of selenium. So those that like Brazil nuts, that's great. Uh, vitamin Z and E, um, usually quite popular in skincare products actually, uh, alongside vitamin C. We don't want to forget vitamin D because it regulates our immune cell uh, cells uh, and we absolutely don't want them going off uh, fighting our own skin tissue, uh, causing those problems like hives and itchiness. Um, organic sulfur or methyl sulfur, <laughs> sulfur um, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, methyl sulfur, sulfur, methane, there you go. I got it at the end, but it's organic sulfur. That is amazing if you suffer with seasonal allergies, actually, or uh, autoimmune conditions, but it's amazing for skin and inflammatory reactions, especially after it's had sun exposure. Helps to just calm down the immune system when it's a bit confused and a bit aggressive, almost stabilizes a bit. That and omega-3 together is brilliant, um, especially when we add vitamin D in the mix. And then um, we've got maca as well. Maca is a great natural food source that helps to stabilize hormones. We've been using it for millennia. There's lots of new research coming out on it. Um, so it's one to watch, but it's actually packed full of um, uh, flavonoids, which are amazing for health anyway, and very, very good for skin. And um, so that's internal, external. Um, we, we're thinking skincare here. Lots of people think skincare. I'm actually thinking more the skin bacteria on you <laughs> than skincare because they are your natural skincare. And that's why hot showers or hot baths, they can strip away the oil that that, that good bacteria like. Antibacterial products, so antibacterial face washes or antibacterial uh, body care products, antibacterial uh, anything really helps not to populate these uh, good colonies that are looking after your skin and actually, again, sending good messages to immune uh, response. A lot of chemicals can interrupt that as well. And skincare is a bit of a debated topic as to whether you should do it or not do it. You know, we can hydrate absolutely by hydrating internally um, and potentially taking some of that hyaluronic acid. You can get it as a supplement as well. Uh, you can get it as a skincare. But I, I'm a big fan of have skincare routines as long as it doesn't interrupt the skin's microbiome. I personally like, um, as long as you, you can tolerate it, which tends to be very, very well tolerated to be fair, almost 100% organic aloe vera gel. Um, you know, something like that with a bit of seaweed extract in, you are feeding those good bacteria extremely nicely. Uh, you're giving a lot of nutrition to the skins externally as well. Um, so it's a, it's a nice approach, especially if you're gonna take hyaluronic acid tablets alongside that during the time of menopause. Um, you know, you can do skin routines. They, a lot of skin routines will help stabilize, but be careful of moisturizers. So anything that's natural moisturizer could, it, could congest the skin. It's gonna look nice for 10 minutes at first as it hydrates, but then it's gonna be quite useful. It could make your skin a little bit lazy as well. So just be careful with the word moisturizer you want something more like a serum or an antioxidant or vitamin serum is usually a little bit more uh, beneficial. They do come with lots of chemicals in as well. So do be wary of that to stabilize them or to make them work. Um, if we want to do it as natural as possible, something like an internal approach with aloe vera on top is great. And don't use too much in the way of antibacterial stuff. Now I know we're in COVID, please antibacterial your hands in situations where you need to. Um, but at home, where you're safe, 
don't be obsessive about it because you are killing you know your, your hands are going to age you know we're talking about skin probably all, uh, all over hands will age with that um for sure and it dries it out further uh, making things worse uh, and then the in-between approach uh, that actually refers to my good uh, i've already uh, said it about the good bacteria i call them in between because they're in there they're internal um, but they are external they're not part of our body they are external so they're in between um, so that's really um sort of my advice uh going forward and i think now is a good time to just go to some questions because i'm sure there's some specifics that you would like a little bit more guidance on or a bit more information on Michael, that was fantastic. Thank you. What I really took from that was just a reminder of how menopause is the whole body and we have to treat the whole body rather than looking at one aspect like skincare and then your mental health and then, you know, your fitness more happy. We have to look at the body as a whole rather than putting it into segments. It's not, it's not as easy to say, oh, just have a skincare regime that will fix that problem or a medication that what fits that problem you know this is the pro this is uh, why i left sort of uh, traditional general practice medicine because you know there's too much problem solving to do in seven minute consultations or 10 minute consultations there's so many pieces to the puzzle definitely i'm going to do my first question which we have had lots and lots of questions about so i'm not being selfish but i am a bit itching what is the best way to get rid of the itching? Because mine's on the palms of my hands. I wake up in the middle of the night and I'm itching like mad. And I've heard this one's for money and this one's for getting rid of money. So I'm equaling it out. And I'd rather just not have it in the first place. Yeah, I think, I think with itching, what we're, we're seeing, um, I mean, first of all, it can be an imbalance between the progesterone, or, uh, progesterone and the estrogen. Um, progesterone could be a little bit problematic there. Um, so if you do, if, you know, if you're in the situation where you're on HRT or something like that, then that could that might need tweaking a little bit um, and uh, and just seeing if that happens. But actually, from now, what you could start doing now is absolutely avoid those antibacterial um, soaps where you can. Okay, because that's going to dry the skin more on your palm. You need you to hydrate really well. Um, internally uh, and uh, make sure your hands get nice and hydrated. In fact, that brings on uh, another good point. During the winter, we have central heating on. Our environments become very dry, actually, so we do need to hydrate more uh, to look after our skin. Okay, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be harder to cope in the winter in the UK, for sure. Um, we also, I think the best thing for you to try, absolutely, would to be trying to dampen down the immune um, response it might be that it's recognizing an allergen uh, so something in the environment that you've always been able to cope with because of that loss of um, function of the immune system within the skin it's it's sort of going on high alert for something that you're quite used to and causing itching or it could be a dryness you know a drying of the skin or both so hands are very very common to get itching in because they they get dry easier than anywhere else because we wash them and wash them and wash them, especially at the moment. Um, but uh, the immune side of it is important. So your the vitamin D, the omega-3, and the MSM, that organic sulfur, they're the triad of things I would try to just balance out uh, any aggressiveness within the immune system, okay? Um, but also avoid that um, antibacterial um, so, you know, hand washes. Uh, and don't, you know, don't expose your hands to cleaning products, wear gloves, things like that. Oh, you added wear gloves. Now, if you'd said don't expose to cleaning products, I would have just said, great, husband can do it now. Then you mentioned gloves, so I've got no excuse. There are, there are some more natural cleaning products that you use more <laughs> plant than uh, uh, plant-based ingredients. So they tend to be a bit nicer. Um, but if you're, if you're not a big cleaner anyway, you do <laughs> Oh, Little muck does you no harm, my mum used to say. Yeah. <laughs> um, dryness, you mentioned briefly, but what is the best way to cope with dryness? We've had people who say they wake up and their skin feels really like scaly and they're drinking lots of water, but they've got no idea why their skin is just feeling so dry. Is there anything? Yeah, there's a couple of do? things. So, waking up in the morning with your skin dry is a sign of dehydration. Now, we do 
we do hydrate, uh, that's fine. And I understand that people still do that. Um, there's a couple of things to, to really, a uh, key here, avoid caffeine in the latter half of the day, it dehydrates us and alcohol. And so if we're trying to adequately hydrate and keep hydrated overnight, that's important. I just mentioned being too warm at night. And I know um, during menopause, you can go quite hot um, and very hot actually, and you are going to dry the skin that way. So actually, you know, um, thinking about solving those with some internal approaches that I mentioned, maybe perhaps adding progesterone into a HRT routine if, uh, if not uh, at bedtime, things like that could, could actually help um, from a, from a sidetrack point of view. But um, hydration, water follows salt. So a lot of people down and down and down water, but if not having good um, levels of minerals in the diet, then actually the water's not always going to move to where it needs to be in the tissues. So, you know, magnesium, we all, uh, you know, it's a great uh, relaxing mineral at night. It's also salt, so that can help hydrate the skin as well. Um, and not staying too warm. So certainly don't sleep with the central heating on. Try and avoid hot baths at night and try and keep nice and cool. I did mention one, one thing that's very good for the skin bacteria actually is uh, not going for hot showers and going for cold showers. Actually, uh, the science is showing that it will make you live longer as well. So if you want to live longer um, and control uh, your skin symptoms, then cold showers it is guys i'm afraid <laughs> and nourish the skin make sure you make sure you're not using skincare that uh, is very chemical because that also could um cause it to be or moisturizer too heavy moisturizer could cause it to become lazy at night so when it does come to skincare you know like a lot of us are experiencing a lot of dull and saggy and a bit boring looking skin and we all want that glow that yeah. we had when we were younger when it comes to skincare, what ingredients or what should we be looking out for that will help give us back that glow? Even if it's just for a few hours to get out and feel yeah. good, you know? Yeah, of course, it's so important. And, you know, uh, I think one of the top things internally and externally, one of the top ingredients is hyaluronic acid. You can get it in skincare as well as tablet form as well. And that's that, uh, remember that it's a little... Um, molecule that draws water to it it's our little pockets of moisture within our skin and we lose the ability to make that as our skin function declines with all these things that happen so you know that's one good thing to look out for and that's probably one uh, one on the top of my list then in terms of brightness and um, and just really good texture and tone um, selenium vitamin C and vitamins A and E you could look for antioxidants as well. Things like coenzyme Q10 can be beneficial. But just note, genetically, not everyone can convert the coenzyme Q10 into the antioxidant form that's going to help the skin renew itself. Okay. Uh, a good test is if you've been to the gym and you take CoQ10 and you're not so achy the next day, you probably convert it. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, so you can get genetic tests, of course, as well to, to check. But Absolutely, vitamins A, C, and E. Selenium is probably one of the best um, things. You, you can't have that in skincare. You have to take that orally. Um, but for brightening and, and giving better skin tone, um, you don't want to, uh, a diet low in omega-3. You want lots of omega-3. So back to those veggies, your wild-caught salmon, hopefully, guys, uh, as well. Or you could supplement with them as well. Um, and, you know... Uh, hyaluronic acid. You can get collagen as well. Lots of people are using collagen. Um, I've seen I use it in some patients. I can see good, some good results, but more for joints and arthritis. It helps build back um, some structure there. Um, but actually, skin uh, does improve with collagen. And I think uh, you can take that uh, internally. And what it does is a clever little mechanism. It's hydrogelized collagen, and what it does is uh, your body. Um, digests it and it, it, it realizes there's little fragments of collagen and it confuses your body it thinks you've broken down too much so it's like oh let's make some more quickly so it's um it's a good little trickery way because uh, lots of people say oh it'll just get digested it's a protein but there is 
there are ways of getting around that and that can be a beneficial thing to have as well a huge thank you michael i found that really really interesting and i've got so much i'm heading straight onto the supplement sites once this is done because i'm getting selenium definitely <laughs> there are so many things that i'm just taking away from this and looking at the chats and the messages we've had everybody has found it really really interesting thank you so much well i'm more I'm, you know if there's any further questions or like you get a bit lost in the supplement <laughs> world uh, i'm sure you can ask your questions and it'll find its way to me i'm more than happy to help and support uh, your, your friends through your journey because it's it's not an easy one as you know <laughs> as i've shown you no that's brilliant thank you all so much and thank you everybody for all joining us it's been great having you all here